Uh, next, we have uh, Jesse Le Cavalier, uh, another recently acquired faculty member. Recently acquired, indeed. Thank you. All right. So I'll also start my 10 minutes on the click. We're on the same. All right, so uh, thank you so much. It's really, it's great to be here uh, generally, and it's also so nice to be here at this event because it's rare that you get to talk about things that are not very well formed. So I appreciate you indulging me at that, uh, at that level because this is very much a work in, uh, this is hardly even a work in progress. This is really just a collection of, of hunches that I have about an idea around uh, architecture and, and under specification of architecture. So I start actually with a clip from the film True Stories from, oops, wait a second. There we go. From the 1986 film True Stories. Texas is the largest producer of metal buildings. Metal buildings are the dream that modern architects had at the beginning of this century finally come true, but they themselves don't realize it. That's because it doesn't take an architect to build a metal building. You just order them out of a catalog. Just pick out your color, the size you want, number of square feet, what style, what you need it for. It comes with a bunch of guys. They put it together in a couple of days. So the, the, as a starting point, you know, that's what we're up against in a, in a certain way. So I want to talk about a hunch I have about the value of under-specification in architecture, what I've been calling a low-definition architecture. So what this is today is really just a collection of, of basically a kind of developing iconography, an outline in a way of, a, of an article that I haven't uh, written yet. Um, so it's really more like a curatorial. I'm working in a more curatorial mode, just gathering things up, but I hope that it becomes eventually a more operative kind of theory of architecture. Just a little background of the other things. I'm working mostly on a book right now about the architecture and urbanism of Walmart. So a bunch of buildings that a bunch of guys put together in a week. But I'm also um, writing in other uh, publications and working on design work as well from the scale of furniture to urban proposals. But, but tonight, the, um, the pair of these two buildings on the left is a floor plan of a Walmart building, and on the right, uh, the smart city of, of New Songdo in Korea, both of which I think are products of an industrialized and commercialized approach to design. And I think both of which are, are fascinating and have a lot of potential, but also tend toward a kind of um, uh, un a kind of univocal and over specification of experience, and I think that's a real issue because I think what that starts to do is to limit our capacity for political imagination, which is linked to what we just saw from Keith. So basically, the the ability to imagine things being other than they are, and I think that's a fundamental aspect of of any kind of design enterprise. And so. Out of these things, what I'd like to do is find some kind of potential middle ground, or maybe middle ground is not the right word, but some way to, to extract certain principles from these things in order to, to move forward. So I go back here to uh, David Byrne for a second, if I can find my cursor. And he's standing in front of this headquarters building. Anyway, this is the Barry Court building, just outside here. It's cool. A multi-person shape, a box. So I think this is an amazing set of ideas. It's cool, it's a multi-purpose shape, a box, and we have no idea what's inside there. If we take these three as kind of points that establish this contour of what I'm calling low-definition architecture, if we reformulate them a little bit into formal multiplicity and programmatic ambiguity, I think we can start to discover some real potential here. So now I want to just skate through these very quickly. Coolness, I'm using it in the sense of McLuhan and the idea of cool medium that invites participation, that is under-specified and requires a certain amount of completion on the part of the audience. Uh, and that's allied with a number of other writers of media theorists like Kittler or Madalar, or maybe you know it from the Somal and Whiting essay, notes around uh, the Doppler effect, all of which try to understand architecture in a low definition. And a good analogy might be the stars in the sky and how we can use those to collectively discover these kinds of uh, figures within them. So the constellation, say, of Pegasus here, which is defined only really loosely by a few stars, but somehow, somehow becomes part of a collective imagination. Um, you could map that onto more contemporary projects. This is a video game, which I think uses really 
uh, careful use of low definition techniques. So the pixelated characters, even though of course they have the capacity to render things fully uh, realistically, instead use a collection of high definition and low definition to produce this really specific and involving atmosphere. Or these are the, uh, the renderings, the Bill Bouton from Philip Scherer, who works uh, mostly with Photoshop to produce these enigmatic images that nonetheless, I think, start to get at some of these ideas of coolness in, in design in the sense that they, they activate an imaginative response. Uh, Multi-purpose shapes. So there's one shape discussion, which is around um, the, this article, for example, from, from Bob Sommel about shape. But I think another way to think about shape is also in terms of not just a perimeter, but maybe in terms of time or scales of organization. So here, the comics of Chris Ware and the antecedents, the things that he really, um, the precedents, the things that he really focuses on and really is fascinated by that are the pre-cinematic comics that aren't just storyboards, but in fact take advantage of the way comics are both seen and read at the same time. So here, three Gasoline Alley uh, Sunday spreads that show the entire house, but also 12 individual moments of that house together. So, so this way of thinking about a form that oscillates between two things at once, or here, uh, Kent Rogowski, taking an observation that jigsaw puzzles are made from the same dies that cut the pieces. So once you figure out which pieces go together, you can actually make these scrambled images that, that occupy a really strange aesthetic realm. Or the sculptures of Irvin Vorm, the one minute sculptures that every single time are different, but every single time are the same. And I think here when you link it, say for example, to the way Walmart works, where they have a protocol and a prototype each time it's instantiated, it's different, but it's also kind of the same. I mean, I think there's something going on here. Maybe you recognize this from the uh, music video. Um, and then the, the third category, we have no idea what's going on inside there. And I think that links to stories about ambiguity that are familiar maybe to, to the discussion that Barbara Venturi begins in Complexity and Contradiction. And he writes here, these oscillating relationships, complex and contradictory, are the source of the ambiguity and tension characteristic of the medium of architecture. The calculated ambiguity of expression is based on the confusion of experience as reflected in the architectural program. So the idea that there's maybe a loose relationship between architecture and, oh, sorry, between program and form, and also maybe between form and context. So in this case, here's Edouard Viard, um, where the figure in the ground begin to blur, or perhaps the drawings of, of Georges Seurat in which the two things begin to merge together. Or maybe it's more about programmatic discovery. So in this case, this is a, a toy called Warm Belly Monkey, which is for um, developmentally disabled children. And it's basically this kind of weird sh like Chewbacca sack thing that you wear, and it's filled with cherry stones. So you heat it up, and it becomes this other body that you suddenly start to learn about through the way you discover its, its use. Or here is a clip from the scene from, from Dune. And I like this scene because it connects to another idea of, of loose fit and form. This is Stan Allen saying, instead, of, instead he's promoting a, a diagram architecture, an architecture that establishes a loose fit of program and form as a directed field within which multiple activities unfold, channeled but not constrained by the architectural envelope. And I think, you know, so here an example where things are sort of partly revealed, partly obscured, always in this kind of temporal dynamism. So now, in conclusion, uh, this is a case study. Here is the pro a project perhaps that you have seen. This is the KAIT workshop at, uh, uh, in Kanagawa from Junya Ishigami. And I think for me this is maybe where some of these, as a kind of case of where these, this, this rapid or this developing iconography of references can start to be more substantiated in an actual piece of architecture. So here, the building is, is the form of the building is coupled with uh, also an inventive program. And so basically, the building is understood as a forest of these columns that you are used to support a, a range of experimental processes in a technical institution. And it's overseen by these six uh, shop dudes who kind of hang out and help you, but don't necessarily uh, instruct you, just are there to, to be a resource. And so basically, the, um, the starting point for Ishigami's proposal was both a kind of constellation and a forest, and they developed this whole way of starting to structure these small columns, which um, you, can, you can see a little bit in this washed out plan. But basically, it's a series of points that form this, this, uh, this field. And it also has very specific architectural impl implications. This is a highly specific, highly precise building that nonetheless, I think, conforms to what I'm trying to, to describe as low definition 
architecture because it's uh, open-ended in, in the way that it's used and the way in which it's engaged and then subsequently the way that it lives on in the imaginations of its inhabitants. So you can see how here the columns, the very small black points, become the structure for, for the whole thing. And then the result is this ambiguous form and, and envelope where the, the, the thin white columns begin to merge with their their uh, surroundings, and then a series of, of other kinds of architectural inventions like this amazing ceiling, and then also a number of, of ways to, to engage these, these, these thin columns. And so you can see that, I mean, this is a very kind of banal example, like how do you put a clock up on this thing, or how do you attach your tube to it? But I think, for me, the building itself is already primed to, to elicit that kind of response in a way that I think is really uh, fascinating and also doesn't give up on a number of other things. So I think if you start to then imagine the feedback loop of some of these examples that I've been showing you. How does a constellation turn into a building? You could ask the same thing. How would this puzzle turn into another kind of building? How would Warm Belly Monkey turn into yet another kind of building? And I hope this is where um, this work I, will, will take me in terms of design uh, proposals. So, so you can see this is very much um, raw material, but I thank you for the, the opportunity to at least articulate it, and hopefully we'll have a chance to talk more uh, afterwards. So thank you very much.